right, so con to continue with this chart that we were just building on, oligopoly is next. Now, for an oligopoly, there are really a couple of different ways that we have to look at this. Now, one example of a product produced in an oligopoly market is crude oil. Not gasoline, but we're talking about oil when it comes out of the ground. Another example of an oligopoly market that's very different from that is breakfast cereal. And you think, wait a minute. So we're going to have kind of, you know, a hybrid here. The cornflake cartel. For, for some of these things. Um, now, product characteristics. If you're talking about oil, it comes out of the ground. It needs to be refined. It's the same. And if you're talking about breakfast cereal, there's uh, some differentiation there. Now, entry and exit. Generally, with an oligopoly, it's going to be difficult. Let's say, for example, that you're going to decide, oh, wait, I'm going to produce crude oil. Well, the first thing you need is some land, and then you need some oil wells that will actually pull something out of the ground. Um, that's a lot of money. Uh, with breakfast cereals, you can get in on that market fairly fairly easily. If you know you just want like a small niche product, you're going to sell to you know maybe a small specialty store. So it could be very expensive. Um, so it could be very difficult. That's an I. Very difficult. Could be really easy, depending on the product. So far, we don't have anything here that's really differentiating an oligopoly. Degree of market control. Now, this is where we see the big difference. With an oligopoly, the key is that you have a very small number of firms. Okay? A small number that are controlling pretty much the entire show. Okay. Small number in control. They are the price makers. Now, with crude oil, internationally, it's OPEC, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. OPEC, obviously there are other oil producers in the world. Um, in the United States, we have lots of domestic oil, but OPEC, is producing the lion's share of the international product. That's the big dog, okay? Even though it's all the same, even though it can be very difficult to get into that market, you have that core group of firms that are calling all of the shots, okay? That's what makes it an oligopoly. It's not the type of product, it's not the entry or exit, it's, it's not, you know, are they advertising or not. It's right here. This is the key. Now, what if you're operating in a market that is an oligopoly and you're not the big dog? You know, what if we're talking about breakfast cereal? What are your big companies? Post, General Mills, and Kellogg. That's, go to the grocery store, pick up a box, and look at who made it. Those are your three major companies. You know, maybe you can throw Quaker Oats in there. They might actually be owned by General Mills. Um, if you're not one of those major companies, then you're just some little guy who has no control over this whatsoever. The term for all those itty-bitty, you know, insignificant players in the market, we call them the fringe market. They're on the fringe because it's like, eh, those guys don't really matter. So you have the firms in control, and then you have the fringe market. They are such an insignificant portion of the total that they're not the price makers. That's really the key to an oligopoly. You can kind of ignore all of this other stuff up to this point right here. You have a small number in control, then you have everybody else. Your product can be the same, your product can be differentiated. Do they advertise breakfast cereal? Absolutely they do. Absolutely. But we can't put it up here. 
because of this. Because you have a small number of firms that are pretty much calling all the shots. Baby food, same way. Diapers, you know. There are lots of markets that fall into that category because of this rate. All right, now, our last market type, and this one, there are a lot of misconceptions about what monopolies are. Um, you know, you, you come out of U.S. history believing that all monopolies are bad. You get through the trust buster thing. And you think, oh, down with monopolies. But the truth is that a lot of monopolies are not only not harmful, but they're actually very good in the particular market situations where they operate. So looking at an example of a monopoly, let's start with the iPod. The only company that can produce something legally called an iPod is Apple. They have a monopoly on it. And I would say that the market for um, digital music players, because the iPod is so huge, probably falls right here. But if we're talking about this product, the only one that can produce it is Apple. Same thing for Apple computers. They recently uh, had a lawsuit against a company called Pystar, mm -hmm. who was building Intel clones and working around the uh, firmware stuff to install, to sell basically cloned computers with Mac OS X installed yeah, on them. Yeah, that's not cool. Um, <laughs> that's what their lawyers thought. Yeah. So if we're looking at something like the iPod, what creates a monopoly? It's a technological monopoly because nobody else has that trademark. Nobody else has the right to that name. Nobody else is allowed to produce that player. It's perfectly legal. It's perfectly legal. Now, product characteristics, um, well, it's all the same because they're the ones producing it. It has no substitutes. No substitutes. If you want an iPod, you're going to buy it from Apple. Entry and exit. Entry into this is legally impossible. Legally impossible. Because Apple is not going to license the iPod name to somebody else. It's their baby. They're producing it. They're going to make all the money off of it. Degree of market control? Total. It's one company. They're doing what they want with this product. Price taker, price maker? No brainer. So I think if you look at this in terms of the product, start with the product. Think about what happens in the market with that particular good. Big difference between egg and iPod. You know, they're all the same. Nobody else can make these. No one. It's all Apple. That's it. Um, huge differences here. Now, what do the three imperfect markets have in common? To some degree, they're all price makers. They all have some degree of market control. They all have some barriers to entry. It might be very high startup costs. It might be that you have legal barriers because nobody else has the patent. Nobody else has the trademark. Nobody else can use the name. This, not really that important. Not really that important. But it's all of these characteristics here. Because they can have some market control with monopolistic by using ads, making you think that their product is better so you're willing to pay more for it, with an oligopoly because they produce so much of the total that everybody else is, and they're just completely insignificant, and with a monopoly because, oh, guess what? You're going to buy it from them or you're not going to have one. That's why we separate perfect competition and put everything else together. 